Well, good morning. Welcome to Church in the Mall and welcome home. And, you know, everything Tom said is, is so true. I think we've been here now about 12 years. And when we first started Church in the Mall, the hope was that we would create a church uh, that people would want to come to, a church that's unique and different, a, a place where you're allowed to be you. And you can explore your faith, and, and we're going to do our best to try to teach Scripture as accurately as possible, knowing full well that Scripture has to be interpreted. But that we're also going to have a, a welcoming community that allows you and supports you as you grow on that faith journey. And, you know, I think Tom and Caden, you certainly have blessed us so much with your music, so thank you. Well, I am uh, Kevin Koski. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and uh, I am, as you heard from Mariah, I'm transitioning my role into doing more with our youth ministry. And I just want to give you a little scenario of what it's like to be a teacher with youth, especially when your own kids are a part of it with you. So it kind of goes something like this. I walk in and I have spilled a little coffee on my shirt and I'm like kind of wiping it off and I turn to one of the youth and I said, hey man, uh, wow, you know what? Does this shirt make me look fat? And the kid says, no, your stomach does. It doesn't stop there. Then one of my kids says, oh, you know what, dad, it's okay. Mom loves you just the way you are. Well, the other one goes, well, wait a minute. Mom just got glasses. I'm not sure. It just goes around and around, and it's so interesting when you're dealing with youth because they're trying to figure themselves out and they're trying to figure life out, but they also are so good at just being honest. They haven't been jaded by the world yet, but they are certainly looking at the world and trying to make sense of it. Right now, we are in such difficult times. One of uh, our friends of our family, uh, she works for the Democratic Party here in Licking County, and her job is to go out to college campuses and invite students to become uh, vote registered voters. And she said, never before in the history have we had such trouble getting kids to just vote in general, whether it be for one party or the other. Kids don't want to vote. They're looking at our leadership and the world around us, and they're saying, what does it matter? The world's a catastrophe. You know what? In some ways, they're right. But if we live in that kind of hopelessness, what kind of community and what kind of society and what kind of people are we going to develop into? And it won't be the kind of people that God intended us to be. And so today, I would like to take you guys through somewhat of, of a two-lesson deal that we have been working with our students next door as we've been looking at our identity as human beings and where do we come from and, and what does that mean. And so as we get into today's lesson, I, I hope that you will see um, some of the unique questions that students are asking that also many of us adults are asking. So as we kind of make our way in, first I, I want to start with this quote by Carl Sagan. The cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Carl Sagan did a lot with NASA, and he even, I think he was the scientist that actually found Venus. Uh, he did a lot of great things, but he had a very weird view of science and humanity and where we came from. And so his idea was, well, if the big universe just all of a sudden happened and all these stars are colliding and dying and growing and coming new, then we must be made of those same type of molecules and chemicals, and therefore he comes up with this great saying. He says, we're made of star stuff, and it sounds so good on the surface until you start asking yourself, well, wait a minute. You're telling me I'm made of dead stars. Is there any value in that? And so if you grew up somewhere between 1970 and 1990, you saw these kinds of ideas flowing through the world as we went through a whole season where people were constantly arguing, is God dead? And then as we moved into the 2000s, all of a sudden people said, God isn't dead, God's alive, but which God is it? And things were very confusing. And even now you'll see bumper stickers on cars that say coexist with symbols from all different religions and belief systems. And what's interesting is being next door to Denison University where I live, I've watched some of the imposiums and as they brought people together and they brought different religious groups together to have conversations, one of the things that's so interesting to me is that every one of those leaders that stands up with all the other leaders of their different religions and belief systems, the one thing they have in common is that they are all not in agreement. That there isn't simply one religion to rule them all or that all religions are the same and just another way of looking at God. No, they're each uniquely different. And, and it's humankind's trying to understand who and what God is and how does it make sense in the world. See, as Christians, we, we have something that is almost even unfair we have the ability to not only know God, but to read about God and understand God from the scriptures. And so today, as we're going to look at this meaning of life, these are some of the questions that our students are wrestling with, and I would argue that even some of us adults are wrestling with. Is there a God? And if so, does this God care about what is going on down here on earth? Where did the cosmos come from? Is there meaning in the universe? 
Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What happens after I die and why is there so much evil in the world? Why can't we fix our own problems? Is there any hope for me? Is there any hope for the human race? Now, it doesn't take a genius to spend 10 minutes watching the news to know that these questions are, in fact, being asked throughout our community worldwide. People want to know answers to these questions. And so today we're going to take a look at the first two chapters of Genesis that I think help to answer quite a few of these questions. And if you're brave enough to go into chapter 3, I think it'll answer even more. And if you're brave enough to read through the entire book of Genesis, you'll see a bird's eye view of God's entire plan and how the whole Bible will then unfold. For today and our purposes now, we're just going to spend time in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And it begins like this. What is it even about? Well, it tells us where we come from. That's creation. It tells us where we're going. That's God's redemptive story. And we see that with Adam and Eve. Once they fall in the garden, God makes a plan to redeem them from the very beginning, before they were even created. And that plan is constantly laid out. We see it in Noah, and then we see it in his children. We see it in Abraham, and God's calling him into a nation, and that that nation then has a purpose to bless all the people of the world by allowing them to see God moving in and through them. And so not only do we have answers to some of these questions just in this statement alone, but Genesis will continually to drive home that point that we have a God who's not only knowable, but a God who wants to be known by us. A God who wants to remind us who we are, where we came from, what our purpose is, why we matter, and most importantly, why we matter to him. And so we're going to explore some of those ideas today as we get into it. But Genesis opens with these words that have been in debate for gosh, probably thousands of years. It's the idea of what is this opening statement? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And many people believe that this was probably just the title. It was kind of the opening part, like, let me tell you what happens. In the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters in the darkness. Now, this doesn't sound like a big deal probably to many of us, but if you were to look at it from an Egyptian or or, or a Middle Eastern viewpoint about the time when this would have been written and understood, you would, you would quickly realize that their belief systems all look at this as chaos and that there is nothing more frightening in the world than chaos. But all of a sudden, we have a God who is standing amidst what looks like chaos in fear to everyone else, and he is absolutely not afraid. In fact, chaos is simply a tool for God. He can will it to do amazing things. What was intended for evil, God intends for good. Or he can allow it to go the other way. And it can be something more of like a disciplinary piece for a bad decision or, or perhaps the outcome of something when we choose to walk away from God and we experience the fallout of that. But here you have a God who's just hovering over the waters. And what's amazing here is they understand this God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, triune, three in one, not three separate gods three separate personalities, one God. Each part having its own responsibility, not only in the creation of the world, as we're going to see where the Father speaks and the Son creates and the Holy Spirit sustains, but also as in our coming to know God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Father God calls His people. The Son presents Himself as a sacrifice for the people and an atonement for those sins, and the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in those that accept that offering. We have God constantly at work, all three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, perfect triune God. Not one outweighing the other, but in perfect harmony together as one God. And that's how the beginning of the Bible starts. There is a God. And guess what? He can create things. So check out what he does next. I love this quote by Phil Wickman in the song, This is Amazing Grace. We sing this a lot in here, but it's who brings the chaos back in order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The king of glory, the king of glory. This echoes the ideas of Genesis in its very self. Before we get into the next verse, I want to point out just a couple words I want you to be looking for. And the first is God said. You're going to see this throughout all the next part of creation. God said, that means he spoke. It was so creation comes out of the mouth of a divine being. And as he speaks, literal creation is happening. If you ever read the wonderful series, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you'll find Aslan, this giant lion who represents God. As the kids first come upon him, he's speaking and roaring and singing a song, and as his song goes out, creation is happening all around him. It's capturing that same image of a God who speaks creation in life. And the next thing is God saw. That means he looked at what he made, and he made a judgment call on it. He decides what's good and what's not good. 
And we're going to see more of that as we get further into the scriptures here. So here we go. And God said, one of our phrases, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and he called the darkness night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, here's what's so cool. He hasn't even made the sun, the moon, and the stars yet. That's not going to come for a few more days. So right now, what we're talking about is over this chaotic nothingness of darkness and water, we have this image of a creator God hovering over the waters, speaking creation. And the first thing he speaks is, let there be light. And the radiant glory of God goes forth. That means the entire universe is now lit by the light of God himself. One of my favorite things to read to people as they're getting ready to pass away is Revelation. And at the very end of Revelation, it's chapter 21. I just want to read a few verses because people find this so encouraging. And you're going to see this interesting bookend, Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Revelation, the end, and you're going to see amazing bookends of some of the imagery here, such as the radiant glory of God coming into the darkness. Listen to these words. John is speaking. He says, And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven had passed away and the first earth had passed away. That means the sky and the sun and the moon and the universe and, and the earth as we know it, all that is gone now and God has restored it to its full original design. I saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a beautiful bride, dressed for her husband. And I heard in a loud voice from the throne of God saying, Now the dwelling of God is with mankind. And he will live with them, and they will be their people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe every single tear away. There'll be no more crying, no more sadness, no more death, mourning. The old order of things has now passed away. He who was seated on the throne, that's Jesus, begins speaking in a loud voice. I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost of the springs of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit this and will be God's children. Now check this out. As we jump ahead, something else happens. Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life. and It was clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river, stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any more curse of death or dying. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and the servants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will be no more need for light or lamps, for the light of the sun is gone, but the light of the Lord God has been given to them as a new light. Now, I hope you also picked up that imagery of the trees of life growing outside of this amazing river that's flowing down the street. If you were to walk through the Old Testament, you would find uh, in the book of Ezekiel this incredible story of the temple of God and how he witnesses a, a little drip, a trickle, coming down out of the throne room of God. And as he exits the temple, that drip turns into a, a wider, almost creek-like. And as he goes farther outside, down through Jerusalem and outside the city, that, that little stream becomes a huge, raging river. And it's that same imagery we see in Revelation. It's also the same imagery we find in Genesis, that God is the outflowing of creation and life. It's why at our welcome bar we have those waves under the bar in the tree behind it, the tree of life in the waters of the living word of God. It's pretty cool, isn't it? But it's more than just imagery. It's the very idea that God has done this from the very beginning, that this has always been his plan. And so when he begins the book by saying, let there be light, his radiant glory shines through the entire universe as if to make it known that the creator is about to do something incredible. Let's see what he does next. On the first day, God creates light and he separates it from darkness. On the second day, he then forms the sky or the expanse. That's, that's what goes around our globe that holds in our atmosphere. On the third day, he forms dry land and its vegetation. So you, can, you just imagine the waters beginning to part and land coming up and out of it. And then as he's doing that, he's putting vegetation and plants and animals all over it. On the fourth day, God fills the sky with the sun, the moon, and the stars, and now we start to get time. Isn't that interesting? God creates time at this moment. On the fifth day, he fills the waters with fish and sea creatures and the sky with birds, but on the sixth day, he fills the land with mammals, reptiles, and finally, mankind. And this is how Genesis opens chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, 
after our likeness. Now, do you see that plural us in our? That's not a misprint, right? Triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and one perfect being of God in perfect relationship. The angels saw this as, as a dance. You know, two people will dance together and they look like they're one. Here's a triune God in perfect relationship, constantly moving together. Never, ever anything but perfect harmony. And as God is looking upon himself and he sees the love that he shares within himself, he says, this is so great, I have to share it with something and someone. And it's out of that overflow of love that God creates. Not because God's lonely, he's in perfect relationship. Not because God needs a bunch of slaves to run around and do his bidding. No, God can create the entire universe without any of us ever even showing up. He doesn't need us, which means he's free then to love us. Because when you need something, you'll do whatever it takes to get it and keep it. But when you're free and you don't have to need something, then you can choose to love it. And so God can create and then choose to love that creation with all his being, which is why you and I matter to God. He has chosen to create us and to love us. So here we have, he starts making man in his image and after his likeness. Now we have some characteristics that we share with God, such as our emotions. We are creative in our own right, and we have the ability to create. We have other things that are very similar to God, and we'll see some of those characteristics in our own lives as we continue to read the scriptures and see who and what God is. But let's continue here for now. He says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In other words, you now have a purpose. You have dominion over the earth. So everything God does in chapter one, making the universe and all that's in it, he's doing for almost like one sole purpose for us. And what would be his game plan in that? So that God can look at us and delight in us, that we become the caretakers of his creation not slaves, but we've been given power and authority over, so now we rule over this earth. And that's exactly what we've done as humanity. But with any choice of living, we, we upsides and downsides. And we know some of the challenges we've faced in our world. But here we have God saying, I want you to go and be fruitful. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Now, this is unique that God then takes humanity and he splits it into two distinct people groups male and female that these genders matter that they're unique and, and they're set apart and it shows that our god desires and loves uniqueness but that somehow in the uniqueness they meant to complement each other or to go together we're going to see more on that in just a minute and god blessed them and god said to them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth and it was so. God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of this earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. At this point, we don't have any meat on the table yet. Everything is plant based. And what's so amazing to me is that God not only creates Adam and Eve and everything in this universe together, but then he makes sure that every animal and every person has their fill. He's provided exactly what they need. What a beautiful image that God creates and then also sustains that creation. And you know what? He's doing the same thing today. Our God wants to sustain us in ways we can only imagine. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. Now, up to this point, whenever God would create something, he'd say, oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. But now, after he's made everything, he says, it's very good. And so when we look at the world and everything in it, and we look at the people that populate it, we see that God is looking at all of it and saying, it's so, so good. It's very good. You are very good. Now, but I like what happens next. Chapter 2 begins. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, everything in it. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he had rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God then blessed that day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, God is not tired. What this rest means is he's at peace. He, he's created everything. He said it's very good. Now I'm just going to sit back and enjoy it. And here is God just having absolute relationship with all his creation. He's just soaking it in. 
There are times in our house where I'll just watch my children, especially as they're growing and they're taking on new things, and sometimes I'm just so overjoyed watching them. I love watching my daughter Courtney play volleyball. I just love watching her learn new skills. I like watching her create, although I hate when she makes slime in our house, but I love watching her create things. I loved going to my daughter Gwen's uh, concert this week and hearing her and her team sing and how beautiful it was. I love watching my son learning how to sail a boat, and, and the first day when that boom kept hitting him in the head, it, it was funny to watch, but there was such a delight of just my son is learning a new skill, something I never got. I think God looks at us the same way. He just delights in being present with us. He looks at you and I, and he says, you are so, so good. You're very good. Now, Genesis 2 is interesting because it's one of those, uh, I told you that story to tell you this one. And now it's as though the author is going to go back and fill in some of the details on creation. What I want to focus on particularly is the creation of humankind. And so let's take a look at what he has to say. Then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, if you have Plato and you haven't been playing with it yet, go ahead and pull it out right now. And I want you to take this cool image of, of God forming man out of the clay. And the reason I want you to do this is because there, there's an intimacy here. Not only does God speak, but God gets his hands dirty. And I love the idea that Adam is made out of dust or dirt or mud or clay. That God is rolling up his sleeves and he's digging into the earth and he begins forming this human being out of clay. And he's thinking about it and he's, he's already got a plan of how it's going to look and, and he's, he's making the head and the arms and the, and the legs and the feet and, and he's looking at it and it's so... And I love this idea of God knowing every hair on our head knowing everything about our bodies, but then even knowing everything about our hearts and our desires. That we have a God who is so intimate with his creation, he knows every piece of us because he designed it that way. And then he makes each of us unique so that you are the only you there is. Even Carl Sagan once said, you need to be nice to everyone because that person you meet and disagree with is the only person like that in the entire universe. Even he got the idea of the enormity of this that God values the individuality of each one of us, but he loves that he has created it in community. And it's in community that we can celebrate the individuality of each person. It doesn't stop there. And God took the man and he, he put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. Wait, I forgot this part. This is my favorite. So as God is forming man, he then breathes the breath of life. Father God speaks. The Son is creating the Holy Spirit, enters into this lifeless pile of clay, and it takes on life. It's kind of like Pinocchio. And sometimes I wonder, where do we get stories like that? And it's, it's, it's written into our DNA. Of course we want to be real. And here's this incredible experience of God's intimacy of breathing life. Now that God takes man and he puts him in this Garden of Eden, this beautiful place he made just for him that's full of all these animals and all these plants and trees and that everything Adam needs is provided right there. In other words, God has created the world to sustain us. That's why we have an atmosphere the way we do. That's why the earth rotates in a certain way, and, and if it was even off a, a degree, we, we would cease to exist. If the speed of, of the rotation of the earth was off a slightest bit, things would be chaotic here. But somehow God took all of that into account. I also liked when Carl Sagan began to explore the universe around using the Hubble telescope, and he found Venus and, and discovered it and made a big deal about it, but he then said, there isn't a single planet like ours that there's something so unique about the earth. There isn't anything that's inhabitable. Yes, we'll go and visit these places one day, but it's not inhabitable. The earth was made just for us to inhabit. Now, God places them in the garden, and he commands the man, saying, you may, suffer, or you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, God puts this interesting piece right here. And what's fascinating to me is up to this point, remember as God's creating each day, he says it's good and he says it's very good. And now at this point he says, now Adam, there's, there's going to be this tree. And in that tree is going to be the knowledge of good and evil and being able to judge between the two. But here's the problem. It's not that I don't want you to have this tree. I, I don't want to give it to you all at once. You're, you're too young. It, it would be like handing a seven-year-old the keys to the family car and saying good luck. It would be improper. It would be wrong. And so as a good parent, God says, I I'm going to give you the information as you grow in maturity to get it. But in the meantime, trust me, I will always steer you right. 
And so what happens here is really an issue of trust. Do we trust that God is really going to provide everything we need, which he clearly has, an entire universe created just for you and I, and then making each of us unique and individualistic and special, and then says, now I provide everything you need. Can you trust me in this? Then God said to him, it's not good that the man should be alone. This is the first time God declares something, judges something is not good, and it's that Adam's all alone. He doesn't have the same kind of relationship that God has within himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the kind of intimacy where the two become one, and so he creates a woman for him, a helper. Now, that word helper in our society is one that we don't like here in America. We don't like the idea of a woman being a helper, but this is the same idea of of, comes along as your partner. This is the same idea of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's a word that they'll use for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not anything less than the Father or the Son. They're in perfect equality together. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, singular, together. And so what we're going to see is that same idea and concept being made into humanity, into two genders, male and female. And that even though each gender shows the image of God, it takes two, male and female, together to make the fuller image of God. So I need to make a helper fit for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God has formed every beast. So just like you're making that clay right now for Adam, God is now forming every animal out of the ground. And think of the intimacy of each animal and how unique they all look. It says, Out of the field every bird of the heavens and brought to them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called that living creature, that was its name. And this is the part where we always joke together with the youth. We say, yeah, you know, when, when he started out, Adam was full of strength and excited. Beginning of the day, he's like, oh, hippopotamus, that's a cool name. And then the day kind of lags on, it's like, eh, bear. And then it gets on, it's like, gnat, ant. You know, you can just see, like, the names changing. But what's funny about this is Adam gets to now be presented with creation. It's as if God is saying, what do you think about this? Now, what do you think about this? Do you know you have a God that takes you into account in his creation? That he wants to hear your thoughts on the matter? But Here's what's interesting. The man gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the heaven, every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper that was suitable or fit for him. In other words, yeah, God, I I really like these animals. You know, the dog's okay, the cat, eh. But but they're really cool things to have. But this is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a relationship. I, I need... So check out what God does next because all of a sudden creation is going to change. Up to this point, God has reached into the ground and spoken life out of mud, dirt, and rock and created all the living things in this earth. But something unique is going to happen here. No longer is God going to dig in the dirt. He's going to take what he needs from Adam. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. That means it didn't harm him. In the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. I heard a comedian one time, you know, Adam wakes up from the sleep and he sees this naked woman. He's like, whoa, man. And it's this idea of seeing something that is so radical, but, but yet so familiar. She's different, but man, she looks a lot like me. I mean, she's got fingers and she doesn't have feathers and hair like all these other crazy creatures. This is something unique. And, and she was taken from me. And this is what is so cool. I love what this commentator says. This is Matthew Henry, who is a very, very old commentator that passed away many years ago. And his commentary is somewhat a little shoddy, but you know what? He did the best he could with what he had. But I love this particular quote because I think it fits so well. He says, The woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of the head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled under him, but out of his side to be equal with him under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be beloved. In other words, the two becoming one, both unique and different, but yet having the same value and worth. And more importantly, better together. God created us for community. We are better together. That's why God lives in community. Back to the story. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. And I love the idea of living in such a perfect relationship that you can bear all and not feel ashamed. This is how God designed relationships to be, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally, that we should be able to bear our struggles and our challenges with one another and not feel ashamed. This is how God designed it to be. 
This is why James will talk about in the book of James. He'll say, confess your sins to one another. Con- confess your challenges and your struggles so that you might be free. Because we're made in the image of the creator, we have the ability to not only create, but to help people through difficult times, to accept people for where they're at, to give them grace when they need it, and to most importantly, love them for who they are, a created, unique being made in the image of God. So Genesis has so much for us. Now next door, when the kids did this, they did it with air dry clay, and these are some of the ones that survived. Let's put it that way. And you can kind of make out the images, but we said basically make yourself. So I, I love the one that's purple with the ponytail. I love the one with the giant honking necklace. I like the little, like, looks like a doughboy. And then one person created this broken heart with a hole in it, and I thought that was very interesting. It's very telling for where our people are at. So we started this with asking, well, what is the meaning of life? Is there a God? And Genesis would say, well, of course. And if so, does this God care about what's going on down here? Oh, more than you could ever know. He didn't just create everything and walk away. He created it and still sustains it to this day. We might say, well, if he's sustaining and he's at work in all of this, why is there evil in the world? Why is there cancer? Why do people get sick and die? And and the answer is simply because we have fallen under a curse. Remember that tree in the garden where God said, you can have any tree, but this one tree, the knowledge of good and evil, you can't take it. No wine before it's time. Wait until you're ready and I will give you what you need to know. Well, Adam rushed in. And he said, you know what, God, I know better than you. In fact, I'm going to be my own God. And in doing so, he got endowed with all the abilities of being his own God. The problem is, like Adam, you and I make lousy gods. We can't control our own day. We can't control our own environment. We might be able to create some stuff with Plato, but quite frankly, we're not really good at creating the universe and everything that's in it. But boy, we sure try. And so naturally, there's going to be some fallout. When we don't trust God and we try to be our own gods, we are going to suffer the consequences of that decision. Where did the cosmos come from? Our creator God who made it with a distinct purpose, not only to bring him glory and enjoyment, but for us to survive and live in. Is there meaning in the universe? Sure, I think there's meaning in the universe. Everything seems to have some sort of created order. Who am I? You are a uniquely created being made in the image of God. There is no one like you. You are special and unique and set apart. In fact, you could even use the word holy, and you were made that way by your creator. Where did you come from? Well, like Adam, we came from the ground. And then we came, like Eve, through people coming together, and life begins to make life. Out of Adam came life, Eve, and out of Eve comes childbearing and more life. You and I are products of God's original design of life giving life to life. What an amazing thing to be a part of that. And that somehow in the mix of that, God allows the uniqueness and the creativity to happen. Where am I going? Well, God has a purpose for each one of us. Remember, he put Adam in the garden to work. There's a specific task meant for you and I. Now, what that is specifically is something that God reveals to us through our gifts, our talents, our personalities, sometimes just our experiences and where we're at. But you can rest in that. What happens after I die? Well, for those that trust in Christ, they won't die. They go on to living life everlasting with God, just like we read in the book of Revelation. For those that want nothing to do with God, that are well aware of who he is, but they want to reject him on their own terms and live life on their own terms, then God rewards them with the same love he gives to those that come to the kingdom. He says, I love you so much, I will give you what you want, eternal separation. And so when we look at heaven and hell, we don't see them as a reward and a punishment. Rather, we see them both as gifts. God honoring us to the point of giving us the desires of our hearts. Problem is, it's just like as a a parent to a young child. Sometimes we recognize before the child can that their decision isn't going to lead the way they want. And so I'm sure God's heart gets broken. But nonetheless, he still rewards his children with the desires of their hearts. Why is there so much evil in the world? We talked about that, the consequences. Why can't we fix all our problems? Because simply we're not God. We need God to step in on our behalf. And so therefore, he has a plan in place, his son and our savior, Jesus Christ, who not only gives himself as a perfect, perfect sacrifice, meaning he does away with that curse of sin and death. He pays that price for us, and it's finished for all time. But then God goes a step further, and he allows the Holy Spirit to take up residence inside of us so that our moanings and our groanings and our thoughts and our 
passions and desires begin to take shape and align with that of the character of God. And so you and I are constantly being transformed and formed into that original design God had for Adam and Eve, for all creation, to be just like our creator, formed more and more and more each day in his image. Is there any hope for me? Oh, yes, there's always hope. In fact, it's the one thing that can't be crushed. Is there any hope for the human race? I think so. I really do. If you're like me, you might try to avoid the news and all the things that are going on in the world, and it's hard to, especially as we're getting ready for presidential elections, and I'm watching both sides look at each other going, I don't know. But each night, these last few weeks, my daughters and I have been reading through the book of Daniel, and it's a fantastic book, and I I would encourage you to read it because Daniel opens with the exile of Israel where their city has been destroyed and they have been taken captive as slaves by the Babylonians. And as they're coming into Babylonia, King Xerxes overrules them and they become his slaves. But somehow out of the midst, God raises up leaders within King Xerxes' tribe, Israelites, that will come and lead the nation. And not only that, they'll reveal the power and glory of God. And every time they do so, King Xerxes begins to see that God is bigger than who he is. But then he quickly turns back. But over and over we see this happen where God is still in control even when we think the leaders of this land are, that God is much bigger than they. And if God can create a universe with a specific purpose and he can redeem that universe for its specific purpose, then he can do the same for you and me. He can do the same for our country. He can do the same for everyone. My friends, we are not meant for this world. We were meant for Eden. And one day God will restore this world to that point and we will enjoy life everlasting with him in Eden. Before I close, let me share one more piece of scripture that I think is just so powerful, and it's a great one to write down. If you want to write down Psalm 139. It's a beautiful psalm that's meant to be a poem or maybe even a song. I'm just going to read a small excerpt from it. Where can I go from your spirit, O Lord? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, well, you're there. If I make my bed in the deep depths of the earth, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day. For darkness is a light to you. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. If God takes that kind of care and thought about each one of us, if he takes that kind of care and thought as he's developing and designing and creating the universe and all that's in it, as he's forming the earth and separating the chaotic darkness and creating light over the waters and then separating all those things, pulling land up and out, making animals and plants, and then finally humanity to rest in this amazing place of Eden. And surely we have a God we can trust, a God who doesn't make mistakes, a God who creates beauty, a God who isn't afraid of chaos, a God whose light shines so dark that even, or so bright that even the darkness tries to hide. My friends, this is a God that's worth trusting.